Welcome to Lofty Pursuits and Public Displays of Confection. Today we're going to make some hard candy for our wedding with a flower in every piece. We love making candy for special events and this is a special one and a special flower. We use a lot of specialized equipment from the 1800s here and this table is no exception. It's 2,000 pounds, it was made in 1891 and it's water cooled. Its entire task is to cool the candy quickly so we pour our hot candy on it. Our hot candy's at 310 degrees and we let the table do its job. The candy is cooling rapidly around the edges where it's touching the table and the metal bars, but the center stays like a hot swimming pool and we take advantage of this by putting in the food coloring and stirring it quickly so we can boil out all the water. We don't want sticky candy. Our hot sugar is divided into three parts. The largest part is clear. It's going to become white and we're going to add citric acid in here because we want this uh, candy to be just a little sour. A tiny bit of it is yellow. That'll be for the pistil of the flower, a little bit in the center. And the remaining part is purple and you saw us mix that in. Now we have the fun of separating it all. We do have a problem, maybe not a problem. The parts that are against the metal have become cold. Too cold to be manipulatable, but cold enough for me to touch with these thin gloves. The center is still a pool of hot nipom candy that will burn me if I touch it. I need to get it all to the same temperature, but this temperature is hotter than what I'm comfortable with touching. So eventually I'll be switching to thicker gloves. The bride and groom said they wanted a flower, specifically a calla lily if I could do it, but any purple flower if I couldn't. I decided to take the challenge because I love the calla lily, and I love what it stands for. It was difficult, but I think it was worth it. When the hot sugar is poured, it pours so tightly to the table, and when it cools, it almost creates a vacuum, sort of like a suction cup, and I gotta break that vacuum before I can work with it. I then cut the colors apart. I'm gonna cut off the green, which will become the stem, the yellow that'll become the piston, you can see the hard bits that were against the metal, and that's where I've been handling it. In most of my videos lately, I've sped up the action to make the videos shorter. And if you want a shorter video, go look around. I've got plenty of them here on YouTube. This time, I thought I'd show you a little bit more of the process, and a little bit more in real time. The entire project start to finish is about 40 minutes. I'm not going to show you all of that, but I can show you a whole bunch. The citric acid will go into suspension in the candy and eventually be frozen in place, but for now it's a little bit of a battle to get it to work into the candy. When the candy is cool enough, I bring it over to our candy heating table, and that's off camera right now, but it'll help me average the temperature and it's going to slow the cooling of the candy and try to keep it at a certain point. This candy I'm working with today is a lot cooler than I normally do, but I've got a lot of detail to preserve, and the more detail I need, the cooler the candy has to be, and the more likely I am for the whole batch to go rock solid before I can pull it into little pieces. In fact, that had happened to me earlier this morning. This is the second batch. The first batch didn't work out. Now, the green over there and the yellow, well, those are almost in their final form, so I want them cooler than the rest. The purple and the white, I need that hot, because those are going to take some manipulation still. These custom jobs I love to do because while we do some planning, a lot of it is figured out on the fly when the candy is and the hot sugar is in your hand, then the clock is ticking. You know, it's sort of like the jazz music I play. There's a lot of improvisation here and it's what makes it fun and it's one of the reasons I love my job. The design is going to call for light to bounce back out through the colors and for it to bounce it needs a reflective surface and we need a white. And that yellow over there is what's going to become white when I pull it. And I'm going to go to the candy hook and I'm going to turn the sugar white. Just watch. This candy hook is another one of those old pieces of candy equipment. It came from Moulin's Candy Store, a company that opened in 1848. And it has a lot of history behind it. But what I really love is the steel that it's made of. It's made of a mild steel, and while it's a little hard to maintain, it absolutely makes the candy move the way I want it to. People have pointed out that the candy sometimes sticks to it and a little bit gets stuck and they have all sorts of suggestions for me. But that little bit of candy has started to crystallize. If I put it back in my batch, I'll be risking the entire batch to save a tiny piece of candy that might be a couple of bites. It's much easier for me at the end of the day to take the hook off the wall, stick it in a pot of boiling water, and all the sugar just comes off in seconds. A little bit of oiling and waxing later and my hook is as good as new, is clean, and is sanitized by being boiled. On May 13th, 2017 at 1 p.m., come by Lofty Pursuits if you're in town. We're making YouTube button candy then to celebrate our 100,000 viewers. By now you have probably noticed the giant banana behind me. It's bigger than the banana we use for our banana splits. 
but it's a giant fiberglass banana that I got one day because somebody sent me an email saying, Greg, would you like a giant fiberglass banana? And me being me said yes. And the next thing I know, I have a giant fiberglass banana that I can hang on my ceiling. Unfortunately, this has left me with the candy maker's dilemma. Where am I going to find a 65-foot fiberglass gorilla to go with it? Like with most candy designs, we have to simplify the design. And we've taken the calla lily, and we've built a design that is recognizable from it. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make the little yellow bit that is the piston, and we're going to make this out of candy. If you notice, we end up having a lot of leftover yellow candy. It's hard to mix a small amount of a color. We need a light purple, and we're going to make that by blending the dark purple and the white. I'm editing this video right before May 13th, 2017. And that's a special day. We'll be celebrating our 100,000 YouTube subscribers at Lofty Pursuits. And at 1 p.m., if you're in Tallahassee, please come by the store. Check us out. We'll be making special YouTube button candy, and you can see that on another video. And we'll be giving out lots of samples. So come on by at 1 p.m. If you're in Tallahassee, we'd love to see you. Or come early and stop in for breakfast. So I'm going to separate this pulled sugar into different pieces and I'm going to store it at different parts of the table that's at different temperatures. You see, I'm actually going to be doing this a bit out of order. Some of the stuff needs to be at one temperature and some of the stuff needs to be at other temperatures. So I'm really cutting this apart so that the parts that need to be coldest are the parts I make first. Like the little yellow piston in the middle of the flower. That bit needs to be done first. I need the side of the flower to be very cold to preserve its shape. The next bit is the green stem, and if I'm not very careful with its temperature, it's going to go bendy and wobbly when it gets rolled in the final candy roll. If you ever make it to Tallahassee, please visit us. We'd love to see you. Our website is www.pd.net, and you can come and check that out and buy some of our candy. We deliver just about any place in the world. The next bit to prepare is a little triangle that's going to be right under the curve of the flower. It's got to be quite cold or it'll distort as well. Now it's time to make the bell of the flower and to put the piston in the flower off center. And because the piston is so cold, it's going to keep its shape and let the bell flow around it. I'm fighting it a bit here because the yellow is so cold, it doesn't want to stick to the warm purple. And now we're going to do the outline, and once again the outline is tricky from a temperature situation. It's got to be warm enough to be flexible, but cool enough that it's not going to lose its shape and just pull out and disappear. Because the shape's going to be irregular, I'm going to make this first piece in two pieces. I'm going to start with the wrap that's going to go part way around the flower bell and down around the half moon shape that I made before. And then I'm going to come back and fill in the difference with a precisely cut piece of candy. Next, I'm going to put in the triangle spacer that we cooled so much earlier, and it's going to act as the final spacer for the top of the flower. I will add the stem, and then I'll fill in the lines on the side that we haven't put on yet. Part of the planning for this candy is knowing how the candy is going to behave. The candy is going to go flat when it lies on the two sides and this flower is going to get thinner. 
But to compensate for that, I'm going to make the log a little flat. And as I roll it, when all the heat transfers, it's eventually going to round out. And my design is going to puff back up to where I want it to be. That is, if I got all the temperatures right. I've kept the white, the green, and the purple very hot. I try to keep the yellow hot, but it's cooled down too much. I'm gonna make the wrap out of the white, and I'm gonna go level it out into a nice rectangular piece the right diameter. Then I'm also gonna make the wrap, and I'm gonna make green and purple stripes in the wrap. The green stripes are there mostly because I had leftover green. It's a lot of a candy maker's trick to extend your batch. Put stripes in the candy, use any leftover colors you have lying around. And then we're gonna wrap it up and roll it a bit so that the heat all evens up. I need that little yellow bit that was so cold before to warm back up. And fortunately it's small enough that it probably has already from the purple wrap around it. When I was a kid living back in Brooklyn, I had a little plot of land at the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. A lot of people didn't have places to garden, so the city set up these vegetable gardens that children could tend in the botanical gardens. And I spent a lot of time exploring the gardens, and one of the things I discovered was a Georgia O'Keeffe exhibit. And the painter Georgia O'Keeffe loved calla lilies. I suspect Georgia O'Keeffe liked this flower for its beauty and not its symbolism, and that makes sense. You know, calla means beauty in Greek, and it is a beautiful flower but it was symbolic in a lot of cultures. In most of the world, it was symbolism for spring and rebirth. And that, it makes a lot of sense also, since it bloomed in the spring in Africa where it's native. In Christianity, it was a symbol of holiness, faithfulness, truthfulness. It was a symbol of the Virgin Mary. And once again, it's a beautiful flower. But it sort of has a dark side, and I like that too. I mean, even the name has a dark side. It's neither a calla nor a lily. It's actually related to the philodendron and it's toxic. And I bring this up because I've seen people plant it in their yards who have pets, and they don't know that this is a toxic plant, that their pet could chew on and injure itself. And now it's time to size the log down into the rods and the bite-sized pieces. We've got to stretch this candy very gently so that the image does not distort, or does not overly distort. We're going to make about 1,500 pieces of candy in this batch for this wedding, and every flower is going to still be recognizable, but it's going to be a little different. It'll be like having a giant bouquet of candy flowers for this wedding. To quote the great musician Tom Lehrer, you have yourself to blame if this video is too long. You see, people have been asking me for the past couple of months to make a longer video and not to speed anything up. So this video is it, folks. Probably not going to do this for a while, if ever again. But I was able to get a little further into the candy making process and cover some things I've covered before, but instead do it all in one video. The flavor is blackberry if you're interested. And of course we make custom candies several batches a week for weddings, for parties, for birthdays, for corporations with their logos in it. And if you're interested in that, just go to our website and check us out. The minimum order is 100 ounces, and unfortunately as the design becomes more complex, the minimum order goes up. So contact us with your ideas, there's a lot we can do, and surprisingly a lot we can't do also. But what we can and can't do isn't necessarily obvious. All that's left now is the cutting of the candy. And we do this with this little sharpened spatula, and we do it really fast. And the main reason I do it really fast is it's very hard to do slow. And there we have it. About 1,500 pieces of candy with tiny images of calla lilies in each one. And the best part about it is it's going to a wedding and it's going to make somebody happy. They also got another batch of candy with their initials in it and we blended it together in the packages. They seem to be very happy with it and we're so happy that we could be part of such an important day. Thank you for watching this video. If you can, please subscribe to us here on YouTube. We're trying to go for a million subscribers. 
And we're going to see if that one's possible, but I didn't think 100000 was possible. If you're ever in Tallahassee, please come and visit us. You can get the candy in person, but if you can't, go to our website, www.pd.net, and you can buy some for yourself. Also, you know, check us out. We've got Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for watching.